afternoon, everyone. And thanks a lot for being here in this uh, session today on the Bern Lectures uh, seminar. Uh, for those who still don't know me, I'm uh, Ana Micedo Cabrera. I'm the head of the Climate Change and Health Research Group here in ISPM. And today I have the pleasure you know, to be the, um, the chair of this session. Just to give you a little bit of, let's say, background of this um, session in a way, you might remember that uh, this year, 2020, is uh, the year of planetary health at ISPM. But in the meantime, let's say, unfortunately, we had, you know, this uh, COVID pandemic appeared in our agendas, in our lives. So uh, um, let's say that eventually we decided that for these lectures that initially we allocated for some, let's say, uh, uh, slots for talking about planetary health as part of the activities within the, our agenda in this year, we decided to kind of mix let's say the two main topics nowadays that is planetary health and COVID-19. And um, as you could somehow expect that in a way there are lots of connections between these two, between these two topics. Thinking for example, that uh, we know that uh, there are clear connections about the, uh, let's say the, the, um, uh, the COVID-19 is out here nowadays in the initiation of the pandemic possibly to the, let's say, the inclusion of the hum human influences, or possibly to think about all the environmental social factors that are surrounding the spread of the disease and the transmission, and possibly thinking about what, um, that we can take some lessons from all these experience about global initiatives and uh, policy implementation of the emer emergency to really implement important, let's say, uh, uh, in, uh, measures to tackle this huge problem that we can somehow extrapolate to the issue of planetary health or climate change. And uh, for today, we have, in a way, the pleasure of having Rachel Lowe. Um, and as you will see from, from her lecture, she will clearly show what are these links between the COVID-19 and uh, her work during the, these last years about the, the use of, uh, of Earth observations or climate data and uh, in the, um, let's say, in the application for the control of infectious diseases. So um, let me just first um, briefly introduce Rachel. Um, Rachel is an associate professor of the London School in Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She is a recipient of the prestigious Dorothy Hodgkin Fellowship of the Royal Society in the UK. Her research is mostly focused on understanding how environmental and socioeconomic factors interact in the, to assess the risk of disease transmission, in particular in relation to dengue fever, fever and Zika virus, and more recently to COVID-19. Previously, she was a postdoctoral scientist and head of the climate services of, the, of health at the Catalan Institute of Climate Sciences in Barcelona, in Spain. She organizes and teaches on international and regional climate and health capacity building activities for postgraduate students and public health practitioners. Her outreach activities and previous research on the early warning system have been showcased in policy reports published in the Nation Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, World Meteorological Organization, and World Health Organization. To, nowadays, she leads a group of researchers working between the Center of Mathematical Modeling on Infectious Diseases and the Center on Climate Change and Planetary Health of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, currently, she's also a visiting scholar at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health, IS Global. So, um, yeah, now I will give the, the floor to Rachel. First of all, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's a great pleasure having you here. You know that we, um, well, I met Rachel while I was at the London School. Uh, I have very, you know, um, very important links with her. And uh, she is an excellent researcher, but more simply, an excellent person and empowered, an empowered woman, and I think a clear example of early career researcher and with a very promising future. So um, yeah, just a few things for in terms of housekeeping. Please uh, keep your microphone off during the, the session. And if you have any question, please put it in the chat. The idea is that she, uh, Rachel will give the presentation and at the end we will have the discussion and I will try to get some questions from the chat and um, make some, you know, discussion about, okay? So 
Thank you very much. And now, Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for that really kind introduction. I really appreciate it. It's a real pleasure to be able to come and talk to you today about some of our evolving work, uh, trying to understand and disentangle if there may be any connection between weather and climate information and if that could be used to support the COVID-19 uh, response. So I've been working with the World Meteorological Organization on their task team with a group of different experts around the world to try and disentangle some of this information and think how we can advise uh, meteorological services about how they may be able to help and support this effort. So as we know, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory viral infection and there has been a lot of questions about whether this uh, virus may behave like other respiratory infections that tend to show um, a seasonal cycle. So we tend to see uh, influenza viruses and other seasonal coronaviruses peaking in the winter months in the temperate uh, regions and uh, particularly dry and cold conditions have been found to be more favorable for the virus. But the mechanisms behind that are not very well understood. We don't know if that's to do with the way the virus responds outside the human host or whether that's simply due, due to the way that humans uh, gather indoors in colder months. So it's really sort of an area of, um, it's really an area that's not fully understood and, and, and more research is needed to try and think about that. So there are lots of reasons uh, why um, COVID-19 spreads so rapidly around the world. We know that a lot of this is to do with how connected um, places were with where the epidemic um, kicked off, for example, with Wuhan and then with, in, in other places um, in Italy and Iran and places that experienced these sort of very early academic, epidemics. Also, a lot of the transmission is due to um, personal protection and also government intervention. So the timing of and intensity of these government interventions are really important in, in determining uh, the transmission of this. And then there's a big question about this role of weather and air quality and how this may have uh, impacted uh, the, the, the transmission of the disease in different parts of the world. And of course, population density and the way people live and underlying socioeconomic conditions is really important for determining uh, vulnerability to, to COVID-19. So if we think about all these different uh, factors that, that could influence the transmission, and as we're moving through the endemic, uh, through the epidemic and gathering more and more information and data, uh, we're trying to, different groups are understanding different aspects of this and perhaps early on, there was speculation that um, in uh, warmer temperatures might cause uh, COVID-19 to be less uh, transmissible. But as we're moving forward, we're seeing that that really wasn't a factor in the summer. So why do we need strong evidence of this? So earlier in the um, pandemic, people like ex-President Trump were talking about uh, how this virus would mir miraculously disappear in the warmer months and how it was just a little flu and uh, the hotter weather would make it all go away. Um, of course, that didn't happen. And uh, at the beginning and still, there's a huge uh, flurry of preprints and, and some stu uh, studies have actually been published on this now, trying to look at the role of seasonality in COVID. Uh, this is just showing a, um, this is a map of uh, some of the studies. So there's been uh, 67, uh, well, there's been over 100 studies now at the global level looking at this. And we can see uh, where particularly there's been um, country level studies, say in China, in the US, in Brazil, and some looking at the global level. But most of these are coming up with inconclusive evidence about the role of uh, weather in driving uh, COVID-19. And there's many limitations to these studies. So either they haven't considered important things like government interventions or um, human mobility, or the different sort of uh, unique situations of the different countries when, when determining these relationships. Because if we look purely at the correlations, we're not really going to understand the full picture. So back in uh, March, uh, some, some of us at the London School just published a, a commentary in the Lancet Planetary Health, uh, just showing that really uh, COVID-19, given the sheer number of susceptible uh, people across the globe, was able to transmit really effectively, no matter what the climate zone. And uh, we submitted this, I think, on the 24th of March, and we could see 
um, the, the areas in, in purple are showing where tr local transmission was um, occurring. And only two weeks later, that had just transformed to pretty much the whole globe. And you could see that local transmissioning was happening, you know, even in places with temperatures experience, um, greater than, say, 25 degrees and humidity greater than 70 percent. So really, uh, climate was not um, protective in, in stopping the transmission of COVID-19. And some of this fed into some policy reports uh, written by the Global Health, um, Global Heat Health Information Network, some sort of recommendations for policymakers uh, dealing with this uh, combination of things like heat waves with a COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And really, um, there hasn't been sufficient evidence to suggest that seasonality will play a strong role, at least in this early stage. And this is just one of the recommendations from the, um, the WHO, one of their sort of myth busters, um, that the transmission of COVID uh, can occur in hot and humid climates. And this sort of idea that it might be protective could have led, led to complacency early in the epidemic. And this was another interesting myth buster I found on their website that the new coronavirus cannot be transmitted through mosquito bites, which is a huge relief. But the pandemic has seriously hampered vector control efforts and access to care in the endemic countries. And we're ending up with this um, syndemic scenario where uh, many countries, I, I mean, a lot of my research focuses in Latin America, having to deal with this situation of overlapping um, epidemics of, of dengue and other neglected uh, tropical diseases and really what that means for public health. And we, we published a piece in the, um, in the BMJ, uh, looking at the situation of uh, COVID-19 in Latin America. We know that uh, Peru and Ecuador have been some of the worst hits in terms of excess deaths. Um, so this is a real problem. And we also published another viewpoint in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases um, with advice about maintaining uh, vector control efforts even through these restrictions and of course that presents a lot of problems about being able to access households and eliminate mosquitoes given sort of stay-at-home measures and um, physical distancing. So now I'm going to present some of the, uh, the study that we've been working on uh, with Anna and colleagues in the multi-city, multi-country collaborative research network in collaboration with the Centre for Mathematical Modelling of Infectious Diseases, which I'm a member of, and also the Centre on Climate Change and Planetary Health. And so we've come together um, to uh, assess the impact of uh, weather signatures on the early transmission dynamics of uh, COVID-19, focusing on these um, over 500 cities uh, in the world, which are distributed among uh, 27 countries. And what we're trying to do is understand how the effective reproduction number um, may have been impacted by uh, particular weather exposures, particularly focusing on temperature and, and humidity. And we've tried to um, isolate this uh, window of time for which local transmission had been established, but before government interventions had had a chance to really reduce contacts to try and see if there were any weather signatures um, using a sort of ecological approach. So seeing as we don't yet have a full year of um, COVID-19 data uh, to try and understand if there may be any sort of seasonality, we need to look at this, the transmission in places with very different climates and see if we can gain anything from that. So we're also considering uh, different confounding factors in this, such as the um, intervention measures and underlying social demographic variabilities. And the challenge is to try and see that once we've accounted for these confounding factors, if we can see any delayed or nonlinear impacts of weather on the transmission of COVID-19. So our database includes over 3 million cases across um, more than 500 cities. Um, and we can see that this is distributed mostly in the Northern Hemisphere. We do see, have some cities in the Southern Hemisphere. And we have, um, despite the climate conditions, we do have like a range of different um, R values across the different uh, cities. So this here is just showing the profile. So we have the majority of cities in the north, northern hemisphere and in temperate regions, but we do have some, um, some cities located in tropical, with tropical climates as well. And we can see the distribution of different sort of population and population density numbers. We also account for things like the proportion of the population over 65 years, 
um, the uh, we're looking at the gross um, domestic product as well, the Gini index, poverty rate, and these different socioeconomic characteristics to try and account for those when we're trying to understand these links. And we're using um, meteorological data from the ERA-5 uh, land uh, database, which is uh, made available by, by the Copernicus Climate Data Service. And this is just showing you uh, examples from the United Kingdom and from Brazil. So this is what the spatial distribution of say temperature uh, looked like on, on a particular day. So this is just looking at the uh, 15th of April. Um, and the stars show uh, on the left hand side where the cities are located in the UK and also we can see where they're located in Brazil. And so we're uh, using this kind of fine scale uh, gridded products to extract the climate information for these cities. And one of the limitations we found with a lot of the studies that have been published already is that um, uh, many authors have used sort of countrywide averages for this. So if you just can look at the little inset maps, we can see, you know, looking at just the mean temperature across the whole of the UK or even the whole of Brazil uh, is, is quite a limitation when you're trying to understand those local dynamics. And we're also using um, the Oxford um, COVID-19 government response tracker to ex extract information on the government index, so this stringency index. And we're using that both to define our, our sort of window of, if you like, unmitigated transmission, although there's no such thing as unmitigated transmission, and uh, also to use that as a confounder in our model. So just understanding, you know, the variation in the intensity of this index across the different countries. Uh, this uh, graph here is just showing us how the timing of those interventions came at different moments. We can see they came in much earlier, for example, in the um, East Asia and Pacific region compared to other um, sort of European and, and, and American regions. And we're also considering where possible um, subnational variations in the interventions. Um, so uh, some colleagues in, in CMMID have been extracting this so we can see, for example, this is an example for the United States where the response was very uh, localized, if you like, not sort of harmonized at the national level. So where we can, we're trying to take into consideration this information as well. So to select our time window, we were looking at having, um, using some sensitivity analysis and having at least uh, 10 cases uh, uh, being observed within the previous 10 day period. So here we're trying to eliminate just those reports of imported cases where transmission wasn't local. And then um, looking, at, uh, looking at different input points. So for example, the stringency index being up to between 60 and 80%. Um, and we've settled um, on a time window. Um, so a maximum uh, stringency index of 70%, um, which gives us pretty much a time window of around 20 days in each place, which the start date of that ranges from around February to April, depending on, on where you are and when the epidemic kicked off. And we're using a, uh, an estimation of the effective reproduction number, which has been developed by some colleagues in CMMID. And uh, this has been calculated, uh, taking into consideration uh, different sort of delays, if you like. So rather than just relying on the observed data, we're trying to capture when the infection um, event actually took place. Uh, so taking into, into account these sort of reporting delays uh, in our estimation of RT. So we're using this uh, package called EpiNow2 that's been developed by Sam Abbott and colleagues at the London School. And we're estimating that um, over the, our, our time window, if you like. And, and this method is uh, the advantage is it, it better, um, it captures increase in transmission earlier on than just using the, the observations and it better allows us to capture those different sources of uncertainty related to the incubation period, the generation time and the delay between onset and reporting. And this is just some early preliminary results um, by uh, Francesco Serra, a colleague from the um, MCC study. So this is just showing us some of the uh, univariate associations between our different um, socioeconomic variables. And we can see a very strong link between our Oxford government index, um, sort of very sort of negative uh, correlation between that and R. So the greater the intervention, of course, the R, R decreases. And then taking into account for all of that, um, what is the association between our different weather variables and the effective reproduction number over our 
wind uh, time period. And we see some modest but um, statistically significant associations, particularly with cooler temperatures and also um, drier absolute humidities, um, which is really interesting. Although the variation of um, the effective reproduction number explained by this is quite modest when you compare that to the, the government index. Um, so it's around six times greater, uh, the variation explained by the index, which is really what we would have expected. And we didn't see very uh, any links really between things like wind speed and precipitation. So if we can understand these, the role of uh, climate information on the transmission of the disease and if it becomes more seasonal as uh, uh, immunity starts to kick in and we start to um, see this sort of settle down into an endemic scenario, then we can think about how we might be able to use climate information to support the response. I'm here just showing an example of a, uh, an early warning system that we put together uh, to try and predict the risk of dengue fever ahead of the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. So dengue is a mosquito-borne uh, viral infection and as it's transmitted by mosquitoes it's climate sensitive and we can often see an increase in dengue transmission with warmer and wetter conditions and sometimes uh, things like El Nino events can uh, cause anomalous climate events to lead to outbreaks of different climate sensitive diseases. So in this case, uh, we'd been working on developing a space time model to predict the risk of dengue using different climate information and socioeconomic indicators. And uh, with the Ministry of Health before the, the World Cup event, we combined uh, climate information. So these climate forecasts, which were issued in February, 2014, valid for the March, April, May season, we combine those with the surveillance uh, dengue cases available to us at the time of forecast and produce this probabilistic uh, risk map of dengue and we publish that ahead of the event in the Lancet Infectious Diseases. And the map here just shows what is the probability of exceeding the high risk threshold and where we see the stronger shades of red we can see that there was a high probability of exceeding that threshold and where we see strong shades of blue that shows there was a high probability of a low risk of dengue so particularly, for example, in the south of Brazil, where it's more temperate and there are, um, the mosquito um, is, is difficult for the mosquito to survive. And also some of the more remote areas of the Amazon, where which tend to be more uh, protected from dengue. Although we've seen in recent years that dengue is starting to sort of edge further south and into the Amazon. And that's something that um, a PhD student, Sophie Lee from my group, is exploring. This is an example of another um, climate driven dengue forecast that we produced for Ecuador, the southern coastal um, city of Machala, which is very sensitive to El Nino events. And when we have El Nino, we tend to have a lot warmer and wetter conditions in, uh, in this area, which have been shown to be linked to uh, dengue epidemics. And particularly um, following the 2016 El Nino, which was one of the strongest we've seen on record, there was uh, flooding events and also warmer temperatures in um, the city. And we used all this information, uh, in use, we formulated a model using the historic uh, cases and climate. And then we used forecasts of the climate at the start of 2016 to predict the evolution of the dengue season throughout that the, 2000, the year of 2016. And interesting, our, interestingly, our model predicted an early peak in dengue cases compared to just using the endemic channel, which is just based on historic dengue cases defined over the previous five years. So had an early warning system been put in place using this sort of ensemble of climate forecasts, which managed to predict this sort of increase in precipitation, which led to flooding and the warmer temperatures, then we may have had a chance to to predict this early peak rather than just relying on the sort of current, uh, the current practice of, of monitoring the endemic channel. And we've been working with colleagues in, in the Caribbean uh, to try and understand the delayed and non-linear impacts, or particularly of the standardized precipitation index on, on dengue. And this is because, uh, particularly in, in Barbados, which is a, a, one of the most water scarce countries in the world, and it, which experiences severe droughts during El Nino events, uh, our colleagues in the Ministry of Health there were starting to notice a change in the dengue epidemiology, which they thought might be linked to some of these dry periods. And because of these drought events, the, um, there'd been recommendations to store water to try and mitigate the drought. But of course, um, if that water storage uh, practices are not, uh, if they're not well maintained or, or not clean, they can end up 
being ideal uh, mosquito breeding sites. So we combined uh, the different dengue information and our drought indicators into a model and we found these really interesting patterns where as you would expect there was an increased relative risk of dengue following uh, immediately after exceptionally wet conditions and warm conditions but we also saw this feature of an increased risk um, three to five months after drought conditions. And we're now working with colleagues in Brazil and we're seeing the same pattern, which is actually exacerbated in urban areas. Um, so that's a piece of work that we're working on at the moment. So this is really interesting and provides interesting timeframes for, be, for being able to design and uh, inform vector control problems to be monitoring and uh, trying to eliminate mosquitoes, not only during the wet and warm seasons, but also during drought periods. And we've been working with our colleagues in the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology to try and think about how we can combine this sort of observed climate information with our forecasts to issue timely uh, warnings to our um, public health uh, colleagues and thinking about how we can use this kind of information to support things like the Caribbean Health Climatic Bulletin, which is a bulletin that's issued on a quarterly basis. It's developed by the Caribbean um, the Caribbean Public Health Agency, the Pan American Health Organization, CIMH, and thinking about how we can support this sort of qualitative information about how the seasonal forecast might impact different sectors, uh, different health sectors, and trying to give some more sort of probabilistic and quantitative forecasts to help support the response. And we've been working to try and think about how we can transition from these theoretical to a more operational learning warning systems and we've developed some our shiny apps in our group so this is an example for um, paraguay which make their um, surveillance data available online on a monthly basis and given all the the wealth of information that's available to us through satellite data and through the copernicus climate data store we can combine all this information and make some uh, pro uh, some predictions about how um, space-time uh, dy dynamics of dengue might evolve. And we've also been working on a UK space agency funded project, um, which has recently won a couple of awards, um, looking at using, uh, based on these kind of modeling approaches I've been talking about, we've been uh, using forecasts from the Met Office in the UK uh, combined with uh, these different uh, data sets have been provided by our partners in Viet Vietnam to produce um, monthly uh, forecasts up to six months in advance for the different Viennese uh, provinces. And this has been a really interesting experience, learning from the stakeholders what kind of threshold they're interested in and how they want that information presented. So I think that's everything I had to say today and I would welcome any questions, thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, I don't see any question in the chat. So if anyone would like to say something, please just switch on your microphone and uh, go on with the question. Yeah, Nicola. Hi, Rachel. Thank you very, very much for that talk. Absolutely amazing. Uh, I have a specific question about uh, COVID and uh, change in transmission that I wanted to ask, uh, and it's a it was uh, and I just want I just want to know what do you think about the plausibility and how you might be able to investigate it. So in Switzerland, as you know, we're in a, an absolutely dire situation at the moment. We have almost the highest uh, case rates in the world. Uh, and we had a very, very rapid increase in the number of cases. We're doing much, much worse than the UK. You'll be pleased to hear, relieved to hear. Uh, but what happened is that in uh, sometime in uh, September, there was a, a very, a rather brief, like a week when cases seemed to be going down. Uh, and then very soon afterwards, the the so there was a reached a sort of tipping point it, we had had um, uh, an R E above one for the whole of the summer, mildly above one. And then it seemed to reach a tipping point and suddenly went up at the, the beginning of October. So the, hy the hypothesis about the increase was that the weather had become much colder and people were just doing exactly what, the, what they were doing, had been doing outside the previous weeks and they were now doing it inside and just started to, to transmit. 
Uh, but the, re the reason for the slight dip the, in the weeks before is really unexplained. Now, so you could look at uh, uh, what happened in Switzerland, but interestingly in the Netherlands, there was actually a reasonably similar phenomenon, but it was uh, happened about two, week, two to three weeks before. So you had a little dip in cases and then, then um, a sudden increase. And I'm wondering how you might think about that if you were wanting to look at the effects of temperature change. Thanks. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think it's, um, I guess if you want to look at it from a sort of time series or ecological point of view, I, I guess you'd have to be sort of monitoring the, for example, t temperature and humidity, are prob probably temperatures uh, slightly more important, but also you would need to be thinking about uh, you know, I, I would imagine that th those kind of things are really impacted by the quality of the reporting. And you may have heard in the UK, we had like a complete disaster where the reporting failed, um, you know, because of uh, Excel issues and things like that. And I would imagine that like maybe some sort of change in reporting practice or or even sort of like, ha you know, ha the, the tendency for people to to actually s seek out a test. Um, that can also wane as well, uh, based on sort of, you know, you get this idea of complacency and then people start to get worried again. So I think it's a real challenge trying to take into account all those things that might influence um, a change in transmission on that sort of week, weekly, you know, week by week time frame and, and thinking about, yeah, if we can sort of isolate those different things. Uh, what, one data source I think is really quite useful is the Google mobility data. Mm -hmm. That can tell us a lot about uh, compliance with any um, sort of stay at home orders or, or how people are moving or if they're spending more time at home. And so I think like monitoring so that sort of those different like dynamic data sets and can tell us, you know, how people are moving. And I, I mean, it would be interesting to explore. I mean, we have access to, you know, hourly or daily uh, climate data, and that might tell us, you know, both how it's seeing how that is correlating with people's movements I think would be really interesting um yeah so I think just trying to to find a way to isolate uh climate from all this is really challenging partly because we don't really understand if it's to do with the our, our behavior and our tendency to stay indoors or if it is the virus itself I mean there was a preprint that was published recently it was quite interesting actually showing that the virus does seem to survive better in in like colder conditions so, you know, there may be something in the in this uh, on, from a sort of uh, virus survival point of view, but picking all that apart with the data we have at the moment is very challenging. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, Christian, I see your hand raised. Yes, thanks, Anna. Hi, Rachel, thanks for this uh, wonderful and exciting talk. Um, I have a question whether, or two questions. First, whether you already started to investigate actually this uh, arguably seasonal effect that, that we've seen in all over Europe, uh, maybe slightly different times in order to quantify it. And the second question would be whether you expect if, if that was the effect of, of seasonality from autumn, um, how much more transmission in terms of an increase in the reproduction number do we have to expect uh, by January or February, which is then actually the, the true uh, season for respiratory viruses in terms of temperature and, and dry air or absolute humidity, uh, and whether that could actually um, lead us into substantial problems in terms of the reproduction number that the measures that are now maybe sufficient to uh, sort of uh, reach a stabilizing phase of the epidemic would not uh, be sufficient anymore in a few months time from now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So as part of the MCC project, we're trying to gather more data for these for the cities to be able to update that. Um, and we are intending to do a sort of time series exploration as well as this sort of ecological early dynamics uh, study. But yeah, I, I, I agree that I, I do think that it's, like worse is to come given that we are entering into you know it's going to get a lot colder and a, a, a lot drier and I think it's going to be really important um that you know the the COVID-19 dynamics will of course be dominated by the, the stringency of the measures and also by the susceptibility of the underlying population 
but we have to worry about the whole package of winter pathogens. And you know, the colder it is and, and the drier, the worse will, will be the other um, seasonal coronaviruses and influenza. You know, things like frost can lead to more accidents and you know, hip fractures and things like that. So I think from an emergency service uh, perspective, it's gonna be really important to be monitoring those uh, climate conditions, being aware that if we are gonna have a particularly cold snap, then there's gonna be have to be some sort of emergency planning that takes place because you know, the, you know, all the hospitals are set to be completely overwhelmed by this and, you know, as we move further into winter. Okay, thanks. We have here a, a question in the chat. Evan, Evan, if you want to, to say it in, you know, in words, just... Yeah, um, I can, I can keep my... Um camera off. But um, hi, Rachel, thank you for this amazing talk. It was incredibly interesting. Um, I have a quick question regarding the data collection for this study. Um, mm -hmm. For the temperature, you use a common source, so we can assume that the bias might be similar or the exposure is similar across countries. But how do you deal with data collection of daily cases for our 27 countries? And then you even have regions, uh, if it reaches that level of granularity, because there might be large differences between in reporting between regions uh, within a country and between countries. So I was wondering, how do you obtain this data? Is it like, do you use it from local partners or is there a global common source? And how do you deal with differences in reporting and biases on such a large scale with this much data? As many uh, people estimating these kind of daily cases on the national level are already struggling with finding the true number for this. Um, yeah, hopefully it's clear. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So for this particular study, um, we're, we're lucky that we're working with the, uh, well, the MCC, the multi-country, multi-city collaboration, which I think you know about, Evan, don't you? And um, so that uh, has allowed us to um, liaise directly with our city partners and they provided um, local data. So of course, as you mentioned, there is a huge amount, there's a lot of problems to do with uh, variation in how that data is collected, uh, whether data is registered on you know, symptoms onset or when a positive test came through. So we have, do have a lot of problems to, related to that. And the effective reproduction number um, estimation tool that we're using, um, it's able to account for those different um, lags if you have that information. But we were only able to extract um, sort of the timing between onset and reporting delays from a handful of countries. So, so one of the limitations that we've had to assume like a set um, sort of global delay, if you like, between that, between the onset and the reporting, which is that is a limitation of, of any estimation of, of RT. And uh, our database represents around, I think it's around 48% of the, all the different um, data reported in the Johns Hopkins database. Uh, so that's kind of uh, like this global uh, go-to database that most people are using. So we have the advantage of using, we have the local knowledge and we have all the data for those local cities, which gives us the advantage. But of course, yeah, that we have these problems that everyone's faces about how, how to, you know, properly account for the variation in, in reporting and biases that you mentioned. Perfect, thank you. Um, I see here as well, Taulan, please. Yes, thanks, Anna. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much for the great presentation. Very nice one. Uh, well, my question is more general and also in line with what was discussed before. I mean, this is an ecological study where where body exposure, the outcome, and also all the covariates have lots of, could have lots of error in measurements and also could differ from country to country and also lots of confounding factors. Like for instance, in a paper I reviewed, democracy index was very highly related to uh, the COVID cases in each country and also like cultural um, factors. I mean, it's different, for instance, in Spain where people hug and it's different, for instance, in Northern countries that, uh, I mean, by default, it's a colder, uh, cultural society. Um, and we see very often like um, in COVID uh, days that ecological studies can, uh, are also very used to guide policy. Uh, so my question to you is like, first, what was the variance explained um, in your results? So not just to focus on significance. And second, what should be the role of ecological studies in guiding policy making? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, in, in terms of the sort of temperature, 
Um, temperature explained about 5% of the variation in R, whereas the government index explained around 30%. Um, so that's really what I would have expected uh, so to have, we have this sort of modest yet significant um, it, it, variation explained by, by temperature. Yeah, of course we're limited by, you know, without having all that sort of detail on, on sort of cultural differences, but that's a very good point. I mean, we also use um, sort of random effects in our model to be able to account for those things that we can't measure and we can't um, observe to try and account for those between uh, city and country variations. So yeah, of course that is a limitation. I, I mean, the advantage of our ecological approaches that we have, um, you know, a large number of cities that are covered by that, but of course there's always a limitation you know, we have very little data, we haven't completed a full annual cycle, trying to understand seasonality at this phase of the epidemic is very challenging. And it's definitely something that we will gain more insights as we track through this ep epidemic and, you know, being able to properly account for the, um, the change in contact rates between human populations is quite challenging. I mean, we're lucky that we have this uh, good quality data from um, like the Oxford government tracker and things like that. But yeah, without accounting for that, then it's going to be very challenging to really understand what the weather signatures might be. Thanks. So, um, Christian, I see your hand again, but I don't know if it's another question. It's just my hand. Okay. <laughs> I don't see any questions there. Anyone would like to say something? Well, I, I can I can I ask yeah. a, a, a quick question? Um, uh, Rachel, it's Matthias here. Thanks very much for a fantastic uh, uh, presentation. Um, to what extent? I mean, going back to Taulan's question about confounding, to what extent can um, novel study designs like, like uh, regression discontinuity uh, uh, approaches actually overcome some of, uh, some of these limitations and, and you know, allow uh, a more robust causal uh, inference. Um, can you comment on the sort of the design, the design issues and, and how, how these, uh, you know, for example, confounding can be, can be tackled over? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real challenge, particularly because we don't have, have that much data to work with. I mean, in, in our particular study, we're sort of looking at um, like comparing a, sort of a univariate association to an association when you then account for these um, different confounding factors. And we're also exploring, you know, taking into account these nonlinearities. So I think, I think that's quite important as well. I think a lot of the, the limitations of the studies that have come out and have been published is that they're either just correlative or they're really not accounting for, um, you know, the real sort of drivers of the, the, the transmission at the beginning of the outbreak. Um, so here we're using a, a sort of a, a two level um, approach that Anna can tell you, tell you more about this particular modeling approach than I can. But um, yeah, it's it's really allows us to be able to account for that between between city and within city variation, and control for the confounders to try and really understand those non-linear and delayed impacts of the exposure. This is Thomas. Perhaps I can follow up. Is that okay? Uh, like following up on this. Uh, so again, of course, I echo the applause. I mean, that was really fascinating to follow. Um, I'm thinking about this set of determinants or set of causal factors that we are currently bound to work with. So of course we would wish to identify the relative importance of each of these factors, right? Um, but isn't it also, a, how can I say, something really worth pursuing, analyzing, that we would work with clusters or sets of determinants. Uh, so to what degree do we really have to right now discern these complex associations of causal factors where in fact we would have quite complex effects from one factor to another back to this. I mean, in the end, we will probably 
not in the foreseeable future, exactly understand how the causal relationships are. But what we know is that certain sets of factors are have, having different effects than other sets of factors. So is this a reasonable approach to actually focus on these clusters of determinants or not at all? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you actually. I've been working with some colleagues trying to understand urban malaria in India and we've been using that the sort of similar approach that you suggest. So looking at the sort of doing a principal component analysis of the sort of socioeconomic drivers and then using them. And it's really interesting to see, you know, for example, the dominant, um, the first PCA represents population density. And then you can kind of see and, and being able to package that all together um, to then be able to perhaps isolate, you know, if you are particularly interested in, the, the, the reason I, I'm interested in understanding how temperature might impact these different climate sensitive diseases is to know if we can actually forecast, use forecasts of the temperature or the precipitation or the drought index to, to predict um, the, the disease risk going forward. So that's why it's, I, I do think it could be a good approach to, to package up the other, particularly those spatially varying covariates. Um, as you say, it may not be a particular uh, one, and, and we did actually do, we actually we did actually do this in the in our study here. We did do a principal component analysis as well of the socioeconomic variables. So that is something that we're also exploring, and I, and I think it's a valid point, particularly when you're interested in a particular exposure. Thank you. Anyone? Yeah. Taulan, it's your hand again, or? It's uh, Nicola. Nicola, please continue, Nicola. I, <laughs> please continue, Nicola. Yes. Sorry, yeah, I had a re just really quick question about your modeling study that you're doing with your cities. Are there any Swiss cities in there? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Do you know, do you know Anna? Yes, yes. Yeah? It's Anna is included. Let me see. Where have we got? Have we got Bern? We want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know if Ben is there, Anna? I, I don't remember. I don't remember exactly the data that I... Uh, I'll, I I'll find out, Nicola, and I'll send you an email. Yeah, we'll like, <laughs> let you know, Nicola. <laughs> I've got the Excel sp spreadsheet sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Taulan. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, Rizzo, I would like also to continue again because I'm very interested on study design and how best we can use uh, different study designs in terms of also causal inferences. And uh, also one question I have is how much was heterogeneity observed within all these, across all these countries that you analyzed? And second, is there any research to show how much of, um, for instance, results of ecological studies are replicated, for instance, well, not all ecological studies can uh, be, uh, um, I mean, can be questioned in, into clin in, uh, clinical trials, which is the best study design, but some questions, yes. So it, are there studies to see how much of these findings are replicated uh, of the ecological studies into uh, our studies? For instance, we see that even meta-analysis of very well-defined prospective studies, only 20 to 30 percent of, of those research, uh, of those results can be replicated into uh, our cities. Into what, sorry? Into our cities? Into, can be replicated as results in very well designed our cities. So the same question, oh, yeah. if for instance you do meta-analysis of very well designed prospective studies, the same results can be replicated only to an extent of 20-30% in our cities. The same mm -hmm. research question. Mm -hmm. No, that's a really good point and it, it's really challenging to, to be able to, yeah, set up these studies, in, you know, with that kind of design and you know, being able to sort of isolate an impact. And that, that's a challenge that we're facing at the moment. I'm uh, trying to understand the impact of drought along an urban gradient in, in Brazil. And it's very difficult to think about, you know, how would you be able to translate that into a, a situation where you could actually control, you know, areas where you are intervening and, you know, clearing up um, uh, water storage containers compared to those that aren't. And I think you're right. I think that's an absolute challenge. How can we translate results from ecological studies into a RCD uh, design? That's, a, I think it's a big challenge. Thanks.
Okay, don't see any other hand up. Yeah, maybe I can just ask you something, maybe to switch a little bit topic. I mean, just to to know, well, of course, within the topic, but uh, you know that we are, as I said at the beginning, we are in the year of planetary health here in ISPM, and we were, um, in a way, uh, we have adapted a little bit our initial goals of this year, trying to uh, say a little bit more about the COVID-19 and the implications for planetary health. And one, of course, one thing is about what we can learn from all this pandemic in terms of uh, actions in planetary health and climate change. And uh, what is your opinion about this? And more importantly, I know that in, uh, within the, the Center of Climate Change and Planetary Health at the London School, you are uh, you know, involved in several like, initiatives and activities to kind of you know, set the path for, let's say, a recovery after the, to the COVID-19 in terms of a more sustainable and resilient world. So I just want you to, you know, if you can tell us a little bit about your opinion and also what activities are now going on within the center to really, you know, make this uh, a little bit more evident. Yeah, that's a really good point. So I think that, you know, everything that uh, has, has, has all the interventions that have happened so far is a real wake up call that when we have to act, we, we can, you know, every individual is capable of responding to an emergency. And the biggest problem is that climate change uh, is probably the biggest threat to public health, but has not been treated as such. And I do think this uh, pandemic, along with the upcoming COP26, I do think there's a real opportunity, a real wake up call that we need to come back with a, you know, a green recovery. We can't go back to business as usual. We can't continue exploiting and polluting to the levels we have been. And I think it's a real opportunity for um, different sort of governments and stakeholders to really like, pull together and think about, you know, how we can see, seeing how damaging this COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been on sort of every aspect of um, society and the economy and the health impacts of, of climate change are set to be to be much worse than this. So I think there's a real, this is a real wake up call to really sort of push forward with proper meaningful mitigation actions to make sure that we can, you know, prevent some of that, some of that devastation that, that the climate change is set to cause. Thanks a lot, Rachel. Um, so if, if there's no more questions, maybe we can close the, the seminar now. Again, I, I would like to, to thank Rachel for, you know, being here in accepting our, our invitation. You know that it would have been great to see you here in Bern with, uh, you know, to have a coffee, to remember a little bit our life in London. And, uh, but hopefully in the future, uh, if the COVID allows us, you uh, will be, of course, invited and possibly, you know, to extend our, our collaboration. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much again. And thank you all for attending this seminar and for the interesting questions. So bye, have a nice afternoon and take care. Thank you very much. Thanks for your brilliant questions. I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.